Welcome everyone to Blackbird Writers Presents. Today I am visiting with Jeff Nania, who was once a Dane County deputy and now works with the Wisconsin Waterfowl Association to restore wetlands. Jeff's books, Figure Eight and Spider Lake, are placed in an area that he frequently visits. Welcome, Jeff. Welcome, Tracy. Thanks for having me. It's really great to talk to you. I, I really loved uh, figure eight and the voice of your main character, um, John Cabrelli, is it's he, he's so lifelike and so real um, and just very down to earth. What a, he's a great character. Um, but first, I want to talk to you a little bit about your background. Um, how much of your personal history do you call on to write these books? Well, I think that my personal history is the foundation for all of these books. Um, I have an eclectic group of friends that I have accumulated over the years in many different fields from law enforcement officers to the district attorney's office to uh, wet and wetland field technicians to all sorts of things. And, um, and all of those people are well represented in these books. I think that uh, when we talk about life's experience and how it plays into things, you know, I, I don't like reading um, books that are not correct. Mm -hmm. And um, the nuances of police work are really something that define John Cabrelli. He is a total street cop. He's not some bad guy looking to beat people up. He is just a guy who goes to work and, you know, he's a community police officer. He believes in the community and believes in doing his job. Um, in figure eight, the first book in your Northern Lake series, it, it opens with a strong sense that something has gone very wrong with John. Tell us about that. Well, it opens up with John in the hospital and he's recovering from being shot. Mm -hmm. He has requested the presence of a reporter from the Namakagan News in far northern Wisconsin. There's a story to tell. And he wants to tell it, not to the press, because the press is all over the place trying to get him to, to tell the story. He wants to tell it to this guy who's a just a good reporter, a down to earth reporter in a small town newspaper. Mm -hmm. And uh, Cabrelli, it's important to him to tell his story. You know, kind of like in our lives, sometimes it's just important for us to tell our story. That's true. And if we don't, it will never get heard. Right. Cabrelli is, is an extraordinary story. And there yeah. are a lot of people who want to tell it. But he wants to tell this guy. Yeah. And so they first meet up in the hospital. And Cabrelli is hooked up to all sorts of machines. And there's a question as to whether he's going to survive. Right. That might be the impetus, I think, for, for needing to tell it too, because he's, he's not doing real well there at first. He's definitely not doing so well. Yeah. And, he, and you know, John Cabrelli is a guy with, he is, is a man of justice. He really wants justice. He doesn't want vigilante justice. He doesn't want crazy justice. He yeah. just feels that the world should be just and things should happen in a way that reflects that. Yeah. And by telling his story, he's not just telling his story, he's telling the story of all the people that were involved in this. And in each one, he's giving them their due. Right. Um, John Cabrelli was also a, a Madison police officer. Um, tell me what you like best about this character. It reminds me of all the police officers I used to work with. He's kind of a combination of them. You know, um, policemen that, or sheriff's deputies that patrol a certain area all the time, they get to know everybody. 
I mean, one of the issues that we face now in this country is that um, if police officers had their way, they would go back to community policing. Community policing like they were taught. And um, it's building this bond with the community, with the people you see every day. It's stopping by the local gas station, getting a bottle of pop. It's all of those things that make you present. And Cabrelli is one of those guys. He knows his area, he knows his people, and he is, he's a good guy. He really is. But he also does not overrate himself. He's clear that he's just another guy and does the best he can. He also has, draws on a lot of, we call it street humor. It's hard to miss that humor. <laughs> I totally agree. Yeah. Um, but it was interesting too, there's a lot of relevance to what happens to him early on in the book as well. A lot of relevance to what's happening in the world these days. And I really enjoyed how, um, how sensitive he was to what happened um, and how it affected him emotionally and personally as well. Well, you know, and this is another situation, police officers face these situations all the time where they have to make a decision. Right. Instantaneously. Mm -hmm. What happens in seconds will then be judged by hundreds of people. For the rest and of their lives. The rest of their lives. But they signed on to make these decisions. Right. And um, Cabrelli is caught in a situation. It's interesting. We shouldn't tell people what actually happened, but right. I'll tell you this. Um, we were given a book talk in Hayward and um, this woman from the crowd said she could barely read that part of the book. And I said, how come you could barely read it? And she said, because it's so true. We, we put these people on the line and we expect them to be perfect. Yeah. And none of them are, none of us are. And I, I, you know, it was very, it was very heartfelt. Um, and it's true. We, you know, we have, things have changed and things probably need to change. But. Right. It's true. Um, John also has some, just to totally change the subject, but John also has some skill as a fisherman. Yes, he does. <laughs> and it's clear from your descriptions that you enjoy fishing as well. Yes, I do. Can you tell us about that? Well, um, I like fishing and um, musky fishing is, is great fun. I find myself in the position of my family. My family gets together for weeks every year from all over the United States and we fish muskies. I have found myself to be in the guiding role for some of my kids and nieces and nephews. And um, I enjoy this whole thing. Musky fishing is not musky fishing. They call it musky hunting. And it's, you know, it's, it's like you calling musk, a musky a fish, you know, is it really a fish? No, it's a sea monster. You know, it is, it is the, the fish of the Northern lakes. I mean, there are more stories and more tales written about muskies than anything else. And frankly, there's one port part where John Cabrella uses a move called the figure eight. That is a classic musky move. Muskies are tricky. They are tricky and they are, their lot in life is to make fools of those who fish them. So what you do is when you're reeling in your lure and you get right to the side of the boat, instead of immediately taking it out, you swirl it in a figure eight. And oftentimes a muskie that's hiding, you can't see it, will take that and hit the lure. And Cabrelli works with his figure eight uh, with the fishing lure and figure eight in lots of other ways. Yeah, I was going to say how, and you tie that into the the plot as the plot thickens, um, and how he uh, gets into the bad guys. And um, go ahead. Well, Cabrelli lost his job as a police officer. He ends up inheriting a cabin in northern Wisconsin that belonged to family members. And um, 
he, he, you know, he's got a lot of healing to do. And he believes in justice still. And so he gets involved in Northern Wisconsin in finding justice for his uncle, who he finds out was actually killed. Right. And um, Cabrelli also f partakes of the healing of the water. You know, there's, I've spent a good portion of my life working outdoors. And I, I've got to say that um, the environment, whether it's prairies or lakes or rivers or streams or wetlands or woodlands, has the ability to heal us. It has the ability to take us into places that we might not be able to go without a little help. And I think about Cabrelli when he first gets on this lake. That's the lake I've swam back and forth in. I've caught muskies on that lake and it is a beautiful place. It is, and it has everything it needs. And it, it's, you know, he's totally, totally caught up in this figure eight. He is now back. He's followed this path. He's now back to a place he went to as a kid mm -hmm. at a totally different time in his life. Right. Yeah, that definitely has a way. I grew up on a lake too. And um, I mean, we visited the lake every summer and yeah. there's just something about being there and being in the water and, and being in nature that definitely brings you back home. You would be shocked at how many people have talked to me at different book events and bookstores and told me about their Northern traditions. <laughs> oh, not, it, it's just wonderful. And you know, it says a lot for our state because our natural resources truly are remarkable. I mean, it, it, um, we have the highest ratio of land to water in the northern third of Wisconsin of any state in the United States. And, you know, we have, I mean, Minnesota, they have 10,000 lakes. We right. have 15,000 lakes. Yeah. And, um, so it's, it's a great place to visit, but it has a lot going. And the wildlife in Wisconsin has maintained itself um, yeah, it's great. Well, I think I'm going to have to end it right there and welcome everyone to come to blackbirdwriters.com and for more conversation with Jeff and um, definitely pick up figure eight. And, and I'm looking forward to reading Spider Lake now too, because I want to see what, what all happens with John in the future. And, and I love your descriptions of the lakes and the, nat the nature up there. And, um, and the mystery is just kind of icing on the cake. So, <laughs> so there's no greater the mystery than nature. With that? There is no greater mystery than nature. That's true. Well, thank you um, very much, Tracy. Yeah, thanks so much for coming, John, Jeff. Hey. And um, we'll see you around the website. All right, thanks. <laughs>